All right, guys, it's Steve with the Ultimate Pickup Artist Convention. On the phone, I've got Bravo, Steve, a.k.a. Bravo. Just go ahead and introduce yourself, man, and give people an idea, kind of where you come from, how you got involved in the game, and uh, how you know Cal. All right, cool. Thank you for having me on this. Welcome, guys. Uh, my real name is Steven Grush. My nickname is Bravo. I uh, got into pickup because I wanted a girlfriend. I uh, just got over a bad divorce. We were married for less than a year. There was a miscarriage. I was down and out. And uh, I got into pickup, didn't want to be some crazy PUA, rock star, coach, any of that stuff. I just wanted to be able to, to get a girlfriend because I was already mentally like lowering my standards with what I was going to accept in the future. And I knew that wasn't the right way to go. So I started the self-help, self-improvement journey. Uh, after a few months into it, I heard about a book called The Game. The difference is I read the book in three days. I started doing all this shit on day one. Started going out three or four nights a week, busting my ass. We started meeting up with other guys on the forum. We started coaching other guys just so they could be wings with us. About a year later, I met Neil Strauss. He offered me a job. And then I became the executive coach eventually of that company and ran the boot camp seminars. Uh, with the guy on hidden camera TV, that was always me. And about f almost five years ago now, I uh, went solo, started my own company. And I've been doing this full-time. Like, this is my full-time gig. I'm not some guy doing this on the side as a, as a hobby or trying to make some extra money. This is all I do. I've been doing it full-time ever since, bravopua.com. No advertisement, no money, no penny ever spent on affiliate ads or links or anything. It's all just my resume, the uh, good the good name I have, and uh, word of mouth. And life's pretty fucking awesome now. Nice. And then how do I know Jared? Um, actually, years ago, I used to run the Style Life Forum. And he was one of the guys that took initiative and was trying to meet up with other guys and trying to make things happen. And I can totally fucking respect that. And uh, I started Casanova Crew, and they started as a layer and a group, and they started going out. And uh, years ago, they started doing little meet and greets and talks, and I offered to help out back then. I did a couple. And I've just kind of – there's not a lot of talks and, and, and events I go to. I just mostly do my own thing. But this is one of the few that I go out there because I, I really like all the Casanova Crew guys I met. Uh, a lot of them are, are actually solid guys and funny and, and, and really trying to help each other out and help others out. So guys who do that are cool in my book, and I'm happy to be a part of this. All right, great. Uh, once again, guys, if you haven't registered for the Ultimate Pickup Artist Convention, it is this weekend, the 13th and 14th, and you can go to upuac.com forward slash discount to get 10% off, and hopefully we'll see you this weekend. How this is going to work, if you haven't been on the phone with us before, you hit star 2 to ask your question. You can go ahead and do that now, and it'll raise your hand in our system. That way we can call on you, and uh, you can just ask your question. And we'll go until, we'll try to go about an hour. If um, if it ends up going shorter than that, so be it. But, uh, I mean, there's really no question that we won't answer. So we'll go to our first question from a cell phone. Last four is eight. Three, four, six. Go ahead and ask your question, man. Hey, brother. Valp on there. How you doing, buddy? Good. How you doing, brother? Yeah, man. All good. So, yeah. Um, so, as you know, I just moved over to the States, and it's a interesting, cool place. And I was just wondering if you had any tips on how to meet cool people and how to just engage in social actions for girls and guys, even if you don't know anyone there. Cool. And actually, I had to deal with this when I got divorced. I moved to a new city from uh, Surprise, Arizona, back to Phoenix. I lived in a, a cool spot, but there wasn't anyone around the neighborhood. And when I moved to L.A. to go work for Style, I had to do this. And then I moved back to Arizona a couple years, had to do it again. So the, the secret I found out, the thing that just works best, I mean, it's a cliche line, but if you live a cool life doing cool shit, you meet cool people along the way. And guys who know my background, I'm a firearms instructor. I do edge weapon training. I teach military and law enforcement. I do all that fun stuff. That's great. I meet some awesome people along the way. Not too many girls. There's not too many girls that are on SWAT teams that need to learn how to defend a knife attack or kill someone with like a T-shirt or a flexible weapon. So I go out and branch off and do other things. One of the things I'm looking at now is cooking classes. I uh, recently got a camera. I started getting in photography. I started going, I, I, back in the day after my divorce, I started working at the yoga studio. So going out and doing things. If you get on Yelp, there's like Yelp meetups. There's meetup.com. 
um, really what I just started doing is anything I'm interested in. Like just last weekend I went to Flagstaff and I went up to Lowell Observatory, which is the observatory where they found uh, Pluto. And I went up there because I wanted to fucking look through the telescopes there and they let you do that at night. And uh, I saw the moon, like it's, it's amazing what you can see through it. And then actually I saw Saturn. And it to you totally fucking see that it's Saturn. And I could see like six moons around it. And that was just like a cool thing to do. But then there's cute girls that actually work there. So I don't know if they're listening to this or where it gets back. There's two that were – one that was super hot, one that was really cool and cute. But then afterwards, we just went downtown and just grabbed dinner at a cool place I found on Yelp. And you just start talking to people along the way, talking to the waiter, talking to the waitresses. And like I said, just meeting people, meeting cool people is a natural byproduct of doing cool shit. So any of the stuff I'm interested in, any of the things I think might be interesting or fun to do, I mean, there's classes on almost everything. Shit, you can go to, like, community colleges and take classes on stuff, and you're surrounded by college chicks. Now you have an excuse to be on a college campus. I mean, there's just so many ways of doing it. Same thing, too. Yoga, CrossFit, martial arts, any clubs or anything you can get to. I work from home. That's literally the way that I network and meet people and meet chicks and meet cool people. And then the other thing is obviously online game, which is one of the things I'm known for. That's how I met my girlfriend now, and we're actually living together, and she's the fucking coolest chick I've ever met in my life. Online game, didn't even have to leave the house to meet chicks. So that's really I do. all I do. I joke about that I'm lazy, and I don't want to do more work than I have to. So I just do cool shit online, hop on Tinder or Plenty of Fish. You're waking up in the morning, you can't go to sleep, you're taking a dump. Send some messages, five, ten minutes on it. That's really all I do, and I have an awesome fucking life. That help? Yeah, it's beautiful, man. Just one quick thing. So, say you meet some cool people, even just guys or girls. I mean, what's like an acceptable way to ask them to stay in touch? Not like number closing girls, but say like you meet a cool guy and they hang out with. Isn't it like a bit odd just to ask somebody's phone number randomly? It it is in your mind, but that's what normal people do. That's how normal people network. So we're all like emotionally and socially stunted. So we're like overthinking all this shit. But when I moved back, this is the line I came up with because I even felt a little bit of that awkwardness is this is, this is my money line. I just go, wow, you guys are awesome. You totally remind me of my friends back home. We've got to stay in touch. And then you're kind of instantly throwing it out there that they're, they're the type of type of people that you're friends with back home. Now you're stating that you're not from around here anymore. Let's stay in touch. And I've done that, and guys are like, dude, you're fucking awesome. I'd love to hang out with you. And I'm like, oh, cool. I know a great whiskey bar, man. We'll go there and talk, and talk guns and knives and girls. And most guys are down with that. All right. That's awesome, man. I mean, shit, I'm, I'm going to San Diego. I'm going to L.A. for this seminar, and then the next weekend I'm in San Diego helping out at Steve P's uh, White Tiger Tantra Seminar. And just guys on Facebook that I know that are in the city. Some guy messaged me before, too. I go, hey, I'm going to be in that neck of the woods. You want to hang out? And that's it. All right, it's awesome, man. Thank you. No sweat, brother. Yeah, All right, man. Thanks. It's strong. Thanks for your question. All right, if you have another question, go ahead and push star two on your phone. Raise your hand. Let me uh, ask you a question there, Steve. Um, now you started working for Neil a while back. How has your game changed from then, from when you've uh, – obviously it's changed since the, the book, The Game, came out, to kind of what you do now? That's a good question. That's actually a, a pretty insightful one, man. That's uh, It's weird. I think what happened was I always hate it when guys say that they were naturals. All these guys get in the pickup, and they're like, well, I was a natural. I was already good with women. I, I haven't met a guy yet that I believe that who says that. Because all the guys who usually get into this, like, usually suck with women. That's why they're into this shit. Uh, but maybe they exist. But anyways, I do think, though, that, a lot, that some of us, or most of us, actually have, like, glimpses of the matrix. And we have, like, ideas of what works and what doesn't work, but we're not sure why. And that's, like, the big frustrating part. Like, why didn't she call back? I thought we had such a good time. So that kind of stuff. So what was weird is when I got into pickup and, or read the game and then started working for, for, for style, is a lot of the stuff I naturally did that worked really well, one of the things being self-deprecating humor, for example, like in the book, it looks like a Bible, it says not to do that. So I was like, oh, fuck, I've been doing it wrong. I'm not going to do that anymore. But after about a year or two, I was like, I don't know, I always like that, sense, that, that, that kind of joking vibe, that's my sense of humor. So I started doing it again, and it actually worked even better than before. And so I learned that it wasn't do, not do self-deprecating humor, the higher level way of thinking about it is don't, don't do self-deprecating humor 
if there's a chance that it's true. So like guys who joke about being gay, well, if you're putting out a certain kind of guy that we know, both know, putting out his vibe, and you joke that he's gay, the girls are just going to go, oh, that's great that you're gay, that's cool. Or if you're a real nerdy guy, which I guess could also be the same guy that we know, and he goes, <laughs> I'm a virgin, I've never had sex with a girl, they're going to believe you. And they go, that's really sad, you shouldn't say that. But I know like you and your vibe and your energy, like if you joke about that with a girl, I know it is for me, that if I'm like, oh, no, I've never had sex, I'm a virgin, ooh, vaginas are yucky. The girls are going to go, oh, you've, you're lying. There's no way you've not had sex. So that was like something I learned that I was like, wow, just because this one guy or these couple guys say not to do this doesn't mean it's bad. It just means it doesn't work for them. Right. So a lot of the stuff I was kind of already like naturally doing because I was a pretty confident guy. I was already teaching like military guys and shit. I was like, man, well, I should be able to roll some of this over into this other areas of my life instead of having a completely different persona I put on when I'm going out doing pickup. So that's one thing. And then the other higher thing, too, is like the whole direct, indirect argument. That's so stupid. To me, it's just the right move at the right time. Do I want right. to be a, a striker or a counter striker? Do I want to be a stand up or a ground fighter? Do I want to use a knife or a gun? Well, the, the situation dictates what weapon, what tools I use and what tactics I use. Same thing with pickup. So any of the guys who talk about that stuff, those guys are all one dimensional fighters. That's how the UFC was 10 years ago, 15 years ago. It's not like that anymore. So I think things like that, I don't really think too much it's evolved. I just think other people weren't seeing the big picture. They saw what worked for them, and they just stuck with that, and they didn't expand. So I think that's been the biggest thing is me just expanding and trying new things and things I never would have tried years ago, like doing now just for the hell of it, just to see what works and what doesn't and being able to make it work. So I think that's the bigger thing It's just uh, uh, for, learn it, forget it, learn it, absorb it, forget it is the old saying, and so that's kind of what it is. I try to learn as much as I can and then forget it. So now just anything works, you can make it work. It doesn't have to be routines. It doesn't have to be lines, but obviously back in the day, that's what we all thought it was. Right, exactly. That's just yeah. training wheels until you don't need them. Right. Um, you mentioned, like, uh, stuff that you tried and see if it works. Is there anything recently you've tried in the last, what, six months or so that you said, oh, give it a try and maybe it's worked really well? Man, six months. I pro I don't know off the top of my head because I've I've been dating my girlfriend. We've been living together for like six months. Okay. Um. What about what about relationship wise then? Is there anything in that relationship you've learned in the last? Well, living with girls is 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 a eye opening experience. I mean, I've done it a couple times. And there's a compatibility issue. There's, you know, making each other feel good or doing special things for each other. Is there anything that you've learned? living with her that you could pass on? Yeah, let's definitely talk going to that. That's that's the biggest thing I learned so far was it's all it's all a screening process. I mean, I, I wouldn't let someone come and help out at one of my events who I didn't have 1,000% confidence in or, or, or know that their skill level and where we're compatible and where we complement each other. Like, I'm so picky on that because owning my own company and, and teaching and all that. So why would I have lower standards for a girl that I'm dating, let alone a girl that I'm going to live with? And after I got divorced, I honestly thought like I would never live with a girl again. I've had girlfriends since then. I've even had a couple monogamous relationships because cause some of the girls I dated, we were on that boyfriend-girlfriend angle, but it wasn't a, a, a monogamous relationship, at least not for me. They were like, oh, you can go do your own thing too, but they just wanted to be with one guy, um, which is pretty cool because I never ever back in the day would have assumed a girl would ever be cool with that. But it's amazing. The more you do this, what you find out, women are totally cool with, and women are just as dirty or dirtier, and they want sex more than guys do, um, which obviously is the case whether you believe in intelligent design or, or evolution. I mean, we both want to mate, so it's gonna, we're both going to have the same drive to do those things. So anyways, really just screening it out because all the issues or any little problems and, and friction you're going to have is just going to be multiplied once you're together because you're together so much. And with me, I work from home, so now it's even more difficult because she goes to work, she comes home, I can still be in my pajamas all day. So that was something. I was like, all the little things that I thought might be issues, I like try to deal with beforehand, and I try to bring mm -hmm. up or address beforehand, just so that way there was like no blind corners when we came into this. We were totally aware of everything going in, and it wasn't like, oh, my God, we're in love. We're just staying at each other's houses all the time anyways. Let's just save money on rent and live together. Like, there were some definite serious heart-to-hearts and talks and 
I mean, we both thought that this was what we were going to do, but we still waited. We, we were dating for over a year before we even did it. Um, we didn't rush into it, too. And then the other big thing is, I mean, just realizing that women, I mean, for me, I'm a very logical guy. Um, if you do a Myers-Briggs test, I'm an ISTJ, so very introverted and, 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 and logical. So if something's bothering me, I want to talk about Usually I don't want to talk about it, but if I do talk about it, I want to, like, come up with a solution. And then when girls want to talk about stuff, they don't want solutions. They just want to either vent and you to tell them it's going to be okay um, or just to sit there and just listen to them and go, oh, that sucks. I feel bad for you, babe, and just acknowledge it. So that was another big thing is just realizing. Here, here's, the, here's the way to summarize it. When I went to Japan for two weeks, I had a great time because I'm familiar with Japanese culture and a little bit of the Japanese language because I studied martial arts for years. So women are a different culture. They have their own language, their own customs, their own way of dressing. They have things they have to deal with, like bleeding from their crotch, like at the <laughs> age of 12 on, that we never have to even wrap our heads around. It's just it's a totally different culture. So if you look at it that way, like I'm dealing with someone from another country or someone from South America or something, they just have different culture and customs. Like certain things aren't going to rub you the wrong way because you're just like, oh, that's their culture. That's just the way it is. Okay, it's no big deal. But I know for me before, that stuff would like piss me off. I was like, why are you being crazy? Why are you not just being smart and logical about this? Why are you doing dumb stuff? And that was just, that's the way they process information. That's the way they interact with other people and their feelings and their emotions. And there's a great line from Ross Jeffries where he goes, we have feelings, women have feelings, but women have feelings about their feelings. <laughs> that's a good one. And that, I was like, wow, that's, I like them, but I don't want them to think I'm a slut. Whereas like us, we're just like, oh, I like the chick, let's have sex. So just kind of understanding that, and then also if the like how much I care about my girlfriend. Like we we've butted heads a few times about stuff, but nothing huge. But even if we did come across it, like we love and care about each other so much that we're gonna both try to find solutions and way to work out problems, and not turn them into bigger issues, which is what happened before. And then you try to bury it or forget it, and that never works. So you gotta have someone who's on your side, who has your back through thick and thin, and gets you, and you get them, and Man, when it happens, I, like I said, I never thought I was going to live with another girl. It's fucking awesome. I've never been so happy with a chick ever in my life. Well, that's good. It's a rare thing, so it's good you found it. I, found right. I, I, thought, I thought she might be the one when I found out she grew up in Alaska, and in fourth grade she brought an AR-15 to school for show and tell. You'd get arrested for even <laughs> joking about doing that nowadays, but that's what she did. Yeah. And when I heard that, I was like, oh, my God, that brought a tear to my eye. So. All right, we got another question. Let's uh, go to Twin Cities. Last four is six, seven, three, six. All right, go ahead, man. Ask your question. Hey, Bravo, sir. Uh, so, um, hey, my question is just about uh, getting up the the like number of approaches. If there's a good system for just getting my numbers up, uh, I mean, there is like some AA issues, definitely. Um, and sometimes I can push through it, and sometimes I can't. But I think the th main thing that's stunting my growth as a PUA is just not getting enough approaches in. All right. One of the biggest sticking points that new guys have. And uh, and how many approaches did you think you did in the last seven days? Less than this. Uh, hell. Less than ten. I haven't kept track. Well, actually, ten, doing around ten, I didn't hear what your second part was, but doing around ten, that's actually a respectable number. What I what I usually give all my new guys when they start working this is 20 approaches a week. And it needs to be 20 women because a lot of guys will wuss out, oh, you just said approaches. No, it needs to be women. They need to be attractive. They need to be worthy of your cock. Like just from looks alone. They need they can't be grandma because that's not going to be – it's just like martial arts training. That's not a good not a good rep. So first thing I always tell my guys is 20. Ultimately, though, what happens is this just becomes your way where I'm out and I'm joking around with the checkout girl or the girl behind me in line or someone at the movie theater or random people walking down the sidewalk or a lady that was in my chiropractor's office today. Like, I just do this all the time. So at the beginning, you've got to make yourself do it, just like exercise, because a fat person who's trying to lose weight, who eats one healthy meal a week, isn't going to lose weight. A fat person who exercises and eats healthy one day a week isn't going to lose weight. You need to do that as your default average. So five, six days a week, you need to work out and be healthy and eat healthy. 
Then if you're lazy one or two days, it's not an issue. So you need to just force yourself through it. I put up the, the picture on my Facebook page the other day. The master has failed more times than the beginner has ever tried. And that's what it all comes down to. I just set myself, just like, just like I'm going to Kali training now, Kali Filipino knife fighting. I'm going to Kali training now five times a week. And it's nasty. It's painful. I got bruises. I've got some fucking bruises on my legs and thighs and shit from being kneed and kicked and stabbed with training knives. Some of them that were so deep and painful, it took like a week for them to show up. And now they're all the dark, horrible yellow. Like I literally just go and get my ass kicked. But I know, because of all the experiences I have before, by going through that and going through that pain period, that's how you get good. So for me, I never had an issue with motivation because when I first started pickup, my motivation was A, survival for my heart-crushing, soul-crushing divorce, and B, spite because I knew my ex was going out to the bars and I was like, okay, I'm going to run into her someday. i got to be surrounded by hot chicks because the moment I'm not, that's when she's going to see me and she's going to be with her new boyfriend and I'm going to look like a loser. So I just went out and approached. Anytime I was out, I was talking to girls. Now, obviously, that's not good thinking, but it was helpful at the time. I never ran into her or anything. But by going out and going and going and going, I got good. There's no secret to being good at running. you got to go out and run the miles. You want to be good at driving the car? you got to get behind the wheel and drive for hours and hours until you get good at it. This doesn't make sense to me, man. Driving a car is so dangerous. If you turn the steering wheel the wrong direction, one millimeter, one degree, the wrong direction at the wrong time, you and everyone in your vehicle can die. That's all it takes. But no one cares about that. We're driving, we're talking on our phone, we're eating a Big Mac, whatever. I don't eat Big Macs, but whatever you're eating from the drive-thru, and you're, you're, you're literally putting your life on the line, but no one cares about it. But when you started out when you were 16, you were scared as shit of getting on the freeway. So I, I got my motorcycle just a couple years ago. I was fucking freaking the fuck out getting on the freeway. With it. it was the scariest thing I've ever done in my life. But now I'm cruising on my motorcycle going 90, 100 miles an hour in the carpool lane with one hand on the handlebars like it's nothing. How did I get good? By putting in the time. So ultimately, if you want to get good, you just have to accept you've got to go through that suck period. And the more you approach, the faster you approach, the quicker you get through this, the quicker that, that sour turns into the sweet. And once you get good, like I don't go out and approach 20 sets. I go out and approach one or two, and I leave with her, or I get her number and go on a date, and that's it. So you're only doing those reps at the beginning. The other thing, too, is when I went out, I get bored easily. Some nights I'd go out, and I'd go, all right, man, talk to my wing. How many sets are you going to do tonight? He goes, five. I go, great. I'm going to do six, and I'm going to go first. And then the other guy couldn't open until I opened. And then I'm always competitive, so I would go first. The, other, the next night I would go out, I'm like, all right, tonight? I'm going to try to get an infield makeout because now my tactics totally change if I'm just trying to get that one goal. One night I'm going to go out, I'm going to try to get five phone numbers. Well, again, my tactics totally change. Another time I'm going to try to get an insta date or a same night lay. Totally different tactics. Or we're just going to go out and have fun tonight and make friends. So that was another thing I did because then when I felt that pressure on, I was like, all right, you know what? Change the, change the plan. Let's come up with a different goal. You know what? We're just going to go out and have fun. Got a new magic trick. I really like magic. Um, I quit doing it because I thought it was nerdy. And part actually when I got back into the game, I was like, fuck it, I'm going to do what I want. So we'd go out and I would always have a deck of cards with me too. I used to do magic tricks in the middle of my gun classes, like on lunch breaks, to like break the tension. I'm teaching everyone how to kill all day. I would do a magic trick, but I didn't let anyone know I did it. So I, I would go out tonight and we're like, fuck, we're just magicians tonight. And we would just do that. But we just do whatever the fuck we wanted just to have fun. I'm not telling everyone to be magician clones, obviously, but... Just do whatever's fun. Make it enjoyable for you because now all of a sudden it's, it doesn't suck to do it. Just like when you hear people talk about how they like going to the gym. Well, that's how you got to eventually do this and shift it to that way. But ultimately, man, you, you know the secret. Just like losing weight. There's no secret to losing weight and getting healthy and losing weight and getting in shape. Eat healthy, exercise. But why is it a multi-billion dollar industry? Because most people don't want it bad enough. They want a, a secret pill. So you know how to get good at pickup. Go out and approach, be active on my forum, get advice, get feedback, and take it to heart and go out and try to always try to improve your game. And if you bust your ass for three to six months, you're going to be fucking solid afterwards. You do it for a year or two, you're going to have fucking skills that guys dream about. And two years from now, 
you're going to look back at it and go, wow, I'm so glad I did this. And to me, that was the most fun I ever had with pickup also, was those early phases. Because I don't, I don't get that rush of adrenaline anymore. I just go out and I just, it just works. And so I'm like, ah, it wasn't nearly as fun. I didn't feel like it was a challenge. So right now, you're going through the fun period. Maybe you don't see it yet, but yeah, it is the most fun. Uh, what kind of that uh, help? Yeah, it helps. Um, did you have any sort of like system as to how you would go out and do your approaches? <laughs> well, when I read the game, I mean, and I haven't, I've never publicly said this before, I thought a lot of the openers in it were fucking gay. Like, I'm going to go up and ask people who lies more or is kissing cheating. I was like, that's stupid. I would never say that. And I actually didn't even do any of those openers until I was getting ready to go out and go to a New York seminar boot camp. And I was like, fuck, man, I, better, I guess I better go out and see how those work before we teach them because I knew it was going to be taught at the seminar. So I just kind of went out and instantly was just doing my own thing. But I looked at it and I understood what made that opener work, and I just made my own. That's like why I came up with, like, it was originally the MySpace stalker. Now it's the Facebook stalker opener. And, um, but yeah, that, that totally happened. That was, that was a real thing that happened. And I just was like, oh, let's ask that. Cause that's, instead of it being as kissing cheating, I'm asking about a friend. Why not? I, I'm always lazy. I joked earlier. I'm not really lazy, but I always just want to be as efficient and as effective as possible. So in my opener, Hey guys, real quick. And I go into the fucking, uh, Facebook stalker opener. That's a DHV about myself also, because I was out with my friends. It was a girl's birthday. Uh, we were picking up the bill at the end of the night, and I was flirting with the redhead, and she was this really hot redhead. You know, like redheads are, are either real hot or they're real not. She was really hot. So I was flirting with her, and she was flirting back, but I thought she was just uh, maybe flirting with me to get a big tip. So I decided next time I go in there, I'm going to hit on her. Well, I got home, and because I picked up the bill on my credit card, she'd actually copied my name down and, like I said, MySpace me, but now we say fi Facebook me and message me. And I haven't responded yet because I don't know what I should do. Do you guys think that's weird? Do you think that's creepy? And that just became like the one of the very few canned openers I ever used. Other than that, I was always using what I call improv because some people say natural game. I think that's just a marketing term. The way I always looked at it was canned material, like a comedian who has sets and goes out there and works on a set like every big comedian, or improv. And I'm better at improv, so I can make that work. So usually it was situational, I'd see something, and then as soon as I'm talking to her, I just transition into a DHV. So that's really, if I had to come up with a structure of my game, it's open, and opening doesn't matter at all, it was then transition to DHV as fast as possible. And the DHV isn't just a bragging story, I'm using it as a way to connect with her, so we're finding some commonalities and something to bond on. But for the system, it really was just each night, we're like, all right, we're in the car driving there, all right, what are we going to focus on tonight? Just like what I've done in martial arts all my life. All right, tonight I'm going to work, or let's say Kali tonight or earlier today. All right, tonight we're going to work on disarms. Tonight I'm going to drill this, this, and this. That's all we do in the car. We just call something. Hey, I read something like this earlier on the Internet. I want to try it tonight. Okay, let's go out and try this. We'd figure it out as we went along. And to me, because I'm not outcome dependent, I'm not living in the future, I'm living in the moment. Like if I had a new routine or a new opener or whatever, I'm just something I'm saying off the top of my head, like that's all I care about right then. And then afterwards, I'd go, okay, why did that work? Why didn't it work? How can I make it better? And my wing and I, we'd fucking debrief sometimes till 2, 3 in the morning going over this stuff. And because we looked at it so critically from a third-person perspective, that's why our learning curve was so fast. But really, it was just I gave my the goal. I'm going out three nights a week. Fridays and Saturdays, those are okay. They're usually real busy and lots of people just going out getting drunk. I never drank at any of the bars or clubs I went to at the time. It was, this was work to me, and I was practicing. And I think uh, we would, we'd usually got like Sundays and Wednesdays, and a lot of like Sunday nights were nice and chill nights, and then Wednesdays were like usually industry nights where we'd meet bartenders and waitresses because that was their night off, so they'd be at other places. And we'd go out on one of the busy nights. And we just kind of picked that, just like, just like a workout routine, and we just made sure we did it. And then on the way there, my wing and I would just come up with a game plan for the night, and we just put it in place. I think having a wing also helps. So if you can get someone... Yeah. It's hard getting your normal friends into this stuff because most people won't understand it. it's outside of the reality. But if you can get on like a solid forum and go to the find a wing section and try to find someone, that might be the best. And I actually made some really cool friends and pick up along the way. So I would do that. Yeah. As long as we'll push well, when I found uh, my wing, we kind of uh... – tell a lot of guys this when I talk is we had a we had a 10 points game where 
we had to talk to ten people. Well, open ten sets a night, and then we owed we owed the other for ten dollars for every point that we didn't get. So that's holding each other yep. accountable. I've heard that too, where guys give a hundred dollar bill or hundred dollars to their friends, they get twenty bucks back for each one. So that that actually sounds like probably a better version of that. Um, yeah. Let's uh, see, I was just so desperate and depressed after my divorce. I was like, "Fuck it, I don't care," and I just went out and approached because I knew that's how you had to get good. Yeah. Did that answer your question there, man? Yeah. Any other quick question? I don't see any hands raised at the moment. Uh, no. I think I'm good for now. Okay, sounds good. Now, you're speaking at the Pickup Artist, Ultimate Pickup Artist Convention too, right? Yeah, I am. I'm speaking Saturday, the first day. Yeah, I think I think it's like me, you, or me, DJ, Fuji, and I think maybe you or maybe after, but... Okay, cool. It'll be good to see you. Did you end up getting that flashlight I told you about? I didn't because um, I kind of put it off, but I should I should get it though. I have to talk to you before. about. Get it before. Get it before what? Before, before this, and then when we're there, I'll go over some of the stuff with you. Is there some place I can get it real quick? Amazon, two day shipping, okay. overnight shipping. But there's tons of places that sell these too, like Cabela's. I mean, there's tons of places that sell. Any tactical store probably sells around there. Anyone who's listening to this, one of the things I specialize in is uh, low light training, which is 80% of all shootings occur in low light situations. So one of the things I helped teach was like how SWAT teams can go into houses if there's like a hostage scenario, go into the house when it's dark and offensively use a flashlight as a weapon. Because a lot of people don't know how to use flashlights, and if someone just leaves it on and I'm the bad guy, I'm just going to shoot at the light. So what you do is you blink it and you strobe it and you move around, and there's all these really cool tactics with it. And if you do it correctly, like I can do, I've actually done training where I can go out and take out an entire SWAT team by myself with paintballs or simunition rounds just because they can never get a bead on me. They can never actually know exactly where I am, kind of like a firefly in the air. So last year at the seminar, I was showing Steve and DJ and a couple other guys how these flashlights can be used as weapons. And since then, some guy actually posted on my forum how he watched one of my videos, he heard my talk about this, went out and bought one, and, I, and he actually said like flat out that he thinks the flashlight saved his life. I forget exactly if the guys were trying to mug him or try to start a fight with them or what, what exactly had happened. It was on my forum a couple months ago, but it's in the armory section, which is like the tactical section we have. And um, he actually said he pulled out the flashlight and he was able to blind the guy and get away. And he's like, I literally am like, think that you're, that flashlight saved my life. Because unfortunately in a lot of states and countries you can't cool, carry cool weapons with you like I do in Arizona all the time. Um, so, yeah, you got to have other options. So, anyways, anyone who's interested in that, if you ever see me anywhere, come out, ask me about it. I always carry a flashlight with me. I'll do the demo. No one believes it to the experience it, and then it's fucking mind-blowing. Right, Steve? Yeah, it is. It's a trip, and it does work. So if you have a question about self-defense as well, go ahead and uh, raise your hand. <laughs> Push start two. I love talking about guns and knives and shit, so all there that. There you go. All right, so let's go to Oakland, California, 4710 is the last four of your phone number. Go ahead. Yeah, and... hey, how's it going? Good. Hey, brother. Is this, is this Steve? Both Steves. Hey, yeah. Steve Miles. Bravo, uh, Steve you coached Bravo. me. You coached me about a, a year and a half ago in San Francisco one night, like the the first night of the summit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I think this I remember. Trevor. I think I remember you. It was a, it was it was a while ago. I coached several I guys, so maybe uh, <laughs> if I saw your face, I would definitely remember you. So, what's your question, man? Well, um, I've been mostly working on day game, and uh, this one woman, you know, I was I went to a kind of a a fair. It was a street fair for ecological stuff. And I remember I was kind of flirting with this one woman, and then I saw her again later in the grocery store. And I, you know, was talking to her kind of in a flirty way, and then I asked her, I'm like, what are you doing right now? Let's go get some tea, or, you know, let's, you know, or, or let's do something later. She's like, you know what, I'm going to be honest. You're just, like, too flirtatious. I'm not really comfortable hanging out with you. <laughs> and so um, I guess I wanted to know uh, if you have any thoughts on that. I mean, maybe uh, she thought I was a player or something. I don't. I don't really know. For for me, it'd be hard to to tell without seeing you. Right. Um, 
I don't know. She could be a hermit or something. I, I you know, I couldn't tell. It's it's really hard to tell without seeing you in action, honestly. Do you have any comment on it, Steve? Um, from what it sounds like with your voice, your voice sounds a little high and a little like playful, and that's good to have. But that could be the cause of it because you never kind of really kind of kicked it into more of a seduction vibe. Um, the other thing is like like with me, girls all know what my intent is very quickly. Like, I'm not just out to make friends. I'm trying to seduce a woman and have sex with her, either once or a whole bunch of times. So you do it that, that's how I'm you're always, making that clear during day game? I'm making it clear all the fucking time. That's what I'm about. That's my life. I'm a confident guy. She knows exactly why I'm talking to her. Day game, night game, there's not really a big difference. The only thing I ever play differently is day game, you're usually under a time constraint. Now, if her friends are around, during day game, maybe it's coworkers and stuff, so you got to be more a little indirect or anything. But nighttime, you also got to deal with your friends too. But a lot of times, you have more time with them at night, and they're kind of looking more to party. Um, but realistically, I don't, and so that's why when you do these kind of things, you filter out a lot of girls. Like I remember an old video, actually, Mihal and Mystery were talking about how they called a girl that night from infield, and I remember watching that, just thinking that was crazy, because if they don't, they're like, oh, other girl, other pickup artists or other guys are going to swoop in and steal their girls. So they got to call them that night. And so my analogy for that is I always look at all these situations as like a campfire. If you have a campfire and it's going to go out because you didn't put, you didn't spend 10, 20 minutes go by and you didn't put fuel or anything on it, it burns out. Then that means you didn't build a campfire, a good campfire. Like a good campfire you can leave alone for a couple hours or you can even go to sleep, wake up, throw a handful of grass on it and blow on it and boom, it's back. So I always try to like do – if I'm face-to-face, -face, I'm doing all my selling then. I don't go face-to-face, -face, get a number, and then try to sell back on the phone. I only yeah, use I the phone to get face-to-face -face time. So I, if I already got him face-to-face, -face, I'm going for it. I'm putting wood on that fire. That's right. why I, I can't even remember the last flake. I think I've literally had two legit flakes ever since I've gotten a pickup because either they're not into me and it's totally clear. We're not even going to waste each other's time. Or they are into me, and it's on. And it's very, very, very rare that shit doesn't work out. Just think about Bill. I, I did a blog post about this a little bit ago. Think about all the things that you would do. If like, I don't know who your hottest girl is to you in the world. Let's say like Natalie Portman, Scarlett Johansson, whoever. If like she, you, you met her two months go by. She was supposed to call you. She doesn't. Finally, she ends up calling you. She's like, hey, I'm in town. I can hang out tonight, tonight only, and it's your mom's birthday. Like, what would you do to hang out with that girl? You'd probably ditch your mom on her birthday just to go on a date with Natalie Portman. If the attraction's that high, that's what you're willing to do to go on a date with her. So if the girls are flaky, then obviously the attraction wasn't that high because it took right. nothing for them to blow you off. I want the girl to skip her dad's birthday because she wants to go on a date with me so bad. So anyways, right, back to the it. day, getting back to the question, flirtatious, playful, and maybe not making the statement of intent intentions clear, but also we got to look at it optimistically. The girl said you were too flirtatious. Well, what's the opposite side of that coin? You weren't flirtatious enough or you were awkward and weird and didn't talk to her. So maybe it's just a sl small, small calibration or exactly what Steven said. She could be a hermit. She could not like that or she could just be making that be an excuse or something. We don't know, but that's kind of my gut. All right, cool. Um, actually, just as you were talking, I realized I had a, a more pressing question. If you um, if you have time, go ahead. That maybe that maybe is more applicable to other men as well. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so I I've um, had a, a high, paid a couple of different day game coaches, and they kind of gave me some conflicting advice about asking questions uh, of the girl. So one said, "Don't ask questions. That's you know." That's not giving value. That's taking value, and it lowers your value. And the other says, you know, once you once you kind of get her interest and she's laughing, then you should ask her questions to get her to invest in you. And um, so I was wondering, in day games specifically, where you guys think that questions fit in? Does, is it, and is it a good use of the time? Go ahead, Steve. I'll answer after. Okay. That uh, that's not ne anything negative at you. A that's horrible to even like be wrestling in your head with that idea. 
Um, this is the problem when you jump around from coach to coach. It's kind of like, let's go back to martial arts because that's what I've been doing for years. Um, one guy going, never go to the ground in a fight, and the other guy going, well, you're a judo guy. Let's throw him on his head or something. You might have to land on top of him and hurt him. So that's kind of the, the problem you run into when you're, when you're going to different masters. Like if you go to kung fu and then karate and then kali and jiu-jitsu, everyone's going to tell you something different. It's hard when you try to mix them together. Um, okay. Back to questions, though. I don't even worry about that. Day game, night game, there's they're so, like I said, it's so small differences. Once you once once you're a tough guy and you can fight and I can fight with a gun or a knife, it doesn't matter if I'm in a house or outside or in the woods or in the desert. Like the same principles apply to everything. So I don't even think like that. And I've never really thought like that. The only thing I ever did was I was like, okay, day game, maybe more people are watching us. But then as you do this more and you're observing people do this, you're like, oh, no one cares and they would uh, start assuming and putting together the picture in their own head of what they imagine is going on. So like if you approach someone during the day, they're just going to look at you and go, oh, they must know each other. So all these, all this what if shit in your head just generally is just a waste of time to even think with and deal with. So I don't even worry about that. So I'm out. I see someone I like that I think is attractive to. I go and talk to them. As I'm talking to them, I ask questions. I answer questions. They ask me questions. I answer those questions. We build off each other. I might need to lead the conversation more. Sometimes they talk more. It's all being fluid and adapting and macro and micro calibrating to the situation. Sometimes the girls are shy. One girl I dated, it was one of the few girlfriends I had after I got divorced. She was Mormon. She was a virgin. She only French kissed one guy before me. At the end of our first date, I'm getting an HJ in my bedroom. So it works on all of them once you get to that higher level. Just engaging them and reading it and going, okay, what's the right move at the right time? Because ultimately, like driving the car, if you go a millimeter the wrong way, like I said earlier on another question, you could be dead. But how do you know? Because every situation is a dynamic, unfolding set of circumstances. And it's chaos. And you must learn how to thrive in chaos. And that all just comes from practice, 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 and calibration. So I don't even worry about that. If I need to ask questions, I do. If I need to lead the conversation, I do. If they're leading it, hey, great. I don't need to. But then I, maybe I'll steer it in the direction I need it to. All throughout it, though, my biggest thing is I'm getting on the DHV. I'm trying to build a connection with her, and I'm seeding throughout it. And I'm throwing these little fishing hooks. In my head, it was always like different fishing hooks. If I'm going deep sea fishing, I use a different hook, a different bait, and a different line, and different tactics. If I'm fishing in a pond at the park, same thing. So throughout my conversation, I'm throwing different hooks with different bait out there, and as soon as one gets nibbled on, that's where I go down. So if I'm talking to the girl and we're talking about hanging out in downtown Phoenix, and I go, oh, have you been to Angel's Trumpet Ale House yet? She goes, oh, no, I heard of it. I wanted to go there. This actually happened during a one-on-one. And I go, oh, my God, it's amazing. They have, like, the coolest beers. They have this giant chalkboard with all these different beers. You totally got to go there. She's like, oh, my God, I've been wanting to go there for so long. Well, now in my head, I already know when I go to the number close, that's where I'm inviting her because I seeded it before, she told me she wanted to go. So then later I just go, hey, you want to go there? I've been there, but I want to go there again. Give me your number. We'll go there together. And I go, we'll grab some beers. She actually had a boyfriend. And then she mentioned she had a boyfriend. And I go, well, are you going to marry him? She goes, I don't know. And I go, well, then that's a no. Because if it was a yes, she would have said yes. So that means it's a no. So you owe it to yourself to grab a beer with me because I could be 100 times cooler than him. And she goes, okay, let's go grab some beers. And I go, no, 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 just a beer. Because right now, I could barely control myself. It's taken every ounce of self-control I have, this was at the mall, not to hop over this counter and have my way with you. So if we go out and have a beer, I can handle myself. If we have more than one beer, I won't be able to control myself and you won't be safe. And she laughed and she goes, I I can't wait to go grab some beers with you. And I was like, wow, you are a bad girl. Give me your number. So are my intentions clear? Yes. We have the date locked in? Yes. And this is with a girl who had a boyfriend. And this was in front of a student. So... That's what can happen if you're confident and you pick up on those small pieces. And that's just from practice. Cool. Okay, on the, my opinion, uh, I think the guy that told you don't ask questions might be uncalibrated. Because in a normal conversation, let me ask you this. Does, do guys who ask questions get laid, do you think? Yeah. And the problem is, I think where that comes from is that you don't want to ask too many questions. Like, you don't want to be an interview. You don't want to have an interview. 
Like I, well, uh, you said I, I was too much rapport seeking. That was the that was the problem. That's in in essence, if you ask too many questions, it can be looked at like that. Because I was recording a guy this weekend, and he was asking question after question after question. Was wasn't giving anything of himself. But there's a solution to it is making statements. Um, some guys would call it cold reading, but just, you know, telling a girl which, you know, she might look like a student or she looks like she's Spanish. That way she can react to you. Uh, uh, but I mix it up. Like I'll I'll make a couple statements and then I'll, I will ask questions. It's not a mathematical equation, you know. If I see, if I hear something that she says, like she said, a hook, then I'm going to ask about it. It's just what happens in conversation. But I don't continually ask questions like it's an interview, because that can be annoying. And good point about the coach, who's probably not calibrated, saying that. That's his solution to his sticking point that he hasn't worked out yet. That's good. That's solid. Does that Thanks. kind of answer, answer your question? Yeah, thanks. Okay, man. It's good seeing and talking to you again, and um, I'm sure we won't cross each other again. Thanks. All right. All right. We'll take one more question, then we'll wrap it up. We've got uh, phone, cell phone from New Jersey. Last four is 5381. You there? Yeah, what's going on, guys? Hey, brother. Hey. Uh, Bravo. I'm actually on your forum. Um, GP. But, uh, GP, you question? said? Yeah. Awesome, man. Uh, my question is more of a tactical thing. So I heard you talk about your flashlights. I'm well aware of that. But uh, my state doesn't car- doesn't allow me to carry a gun, fortunately. And I work in the mall, and, like, in the past couple of years, you know, the, the gun violence in malls have gone up tremendously. So what I'm thinking to myself is, like, how am I going to prepare myself for a situation like that in case it ever does happen? It's funny because today in my mall they actually had um, like a response training for like an active shooter. So, you know, I had no idea how to prepare myself or equip myself, you know, for a situation in case it does happen. Okay. So one of the big things, if we're going to get more into the tactical stuff, is one of my good friends, uh, is Steve Tarani. And this guy is, I mean, you guys have probably seen me with the karambit knife, that hook knife with the finger hole that I twirl around. He's the guy who brought those to America and started designing them. Um, I've worked with him. I've taught with him. I've trained with him. I originally took classes from him years ago, edge weapon classes. That's how I got to know him. Um, He actually has a new book that's coming out that literally talks about all this stuff. When, When him and I were kind of doing stuff together, I split and started doing the PUA stuff. He actually started working for the CIA. And if you guys go to his website, Steve Tarani, and look at his bio, it's one of the most impressive, amazing things ever. Um, he recently got out, and we've been doing stuff together. If you guys saw those pictures on my Facebook page of us doing the knife classes for some local uh, police departments and stuff, that's him in the picture. That's him doing the class, and I'm there helping. Um, his new company, that it basically focuses on this, because this is what a lot of like the government stuff was doing, which is if you are in like a hand-in-hand or engagement or a firefight, or edge weapon comes out, that's like the last 10% of the fight because all these things happen beforehand, before the fight was on. So he actually has a new book coming out. I'm, I'm actually reading the third draft of it right now. It's fucking awesome. It's got, I think it's going to be called Prefense, P-R-E-F-E-N-S-E. So Prefense, Preventative Defense, and it talks about all this stuff. And he's like the guy who was teaching all this shit to like, governments and places overseas and a whole bunch of stuff he can't talk about. So th- that, as soon as that book comes out, you guys will see me post about it on my Facebook page um, and on my forum, like, just, hey, this is a great book. My buddy wrote it. You guys got to fucking buy it. When we were at the SHOT Show, we actually, he was doing a book signing for it, and I was there helping out, and that's it. So, A, once that comes out, that'll specialize in all this shit. But to rewind, one, me, I lived in California. I can't carry a gun there. Fuck California. I moved back to Arizona. I don't like living in a place where I'm the bad guy for having the tools and the skills to defend myself. I've done a lot of training. I have family members who are in law enforcement. I got buddies that I train with who are all SWAT guys and special forces and all that wicked shit. 
Um, once you start working with law enforcement guys, you realize how much bad shit happens that we don't hear about. Just because it wasn't on the news doesn't mean it didn't happen last night. And once you actually do ride-alongs, which I recommend, especially all the people who are, I know it's all cool to be anti-cop now. Um, I've met a couple cops in my life who are dicks. I've met tons and tons and tons of them who are awesome. Some of the best people I've ever met in my life. And they put their life on the line at classes and stuff. But the guys I'm obviously training with, these are also the exception of law enforcement because a lot of them don't even do extra training. But I recommend everyone do a ride-along, and you'll see all the crazy shit that happens. Hey, there's a gun call here. Hey, there's this here. All of a sudden, there's three calls holding, and a close family member of mine who's a cop, he's driving to a call, and it's taking him an hour to get there almost, and he's like, oh, hopefully they can make it till then. So knowing all that, instantly I'm just like, I would never live in a state. It's even hard for me to drive to L.A. this week for the seminar. I kind of don't like it because I always like being in control and being able to defend myself and my loved ones. It's one of my famous quotes. If you can't protect yourself or your loved ones, you're not a man. So instantly de-arming me, disarming me, makes that difficult. However, lots of government guys and guys like that we work with go to places where they can't carry firearms. So edge weapon training. The next thing to learn is improvised weapons, flexible weapon, impact weapon, um, weapons of opportunity, and flashlights. So I went out and took classes on that stuff. The next point is learning about your environment and your situation. Like you're in the mall. Do you know where all the exits are? So if there's an active shooter on the north side, do you know where the, ac the exits are for the other end? Every store has like, hall or every mall has like hallways and back doors and entrances. Do you have that? Do you have the keys to get through that? Is that door locked? Is it not locked? All of a sudden your whole game plan of there's an active shooter, we're in this store, we're gonna lock it down and we're gonna go out the back. Well, what if the manager's not there and she doesn't have the key? Now, all of a sudden, you can't close the gate because other people don't have the key there. I mean, little things like that. So I did this drill on my blog where we actually set an alarm on our phone like four days from now and just a random time, 2.42 p.m., right then something bad happens. There's an active shooter. What do you do? Look around. How can you keep yourself safe? Do you decide to stay there? Do you lock down and, and, and hold out and hope people get to you? Or do you try to run? Or do you try to fight? Well, if you don't have the tools available for you to actually fight back, then really, I mean, to me, it's a no-brainer. If I'm out and about and two guys in SUVs pull up with AR-15s, I've got a lot of firearms training in that situation. I'm driving, getting out of there as fast as I can. Even if I have all my toys with me, I'm outnumbered, superior firepower, that's, I'm not going to fight. So you got to look at all those kind of what-if scenarios. And I do that with a lot of the guys I train with. We go out to eat at lunch during a class. They'll sit down. They'll go, okay, right now, what if an armed uh, gunman comes through the front door. Where are we going? How are you positioned? Do you even see it? Watch those YouTube videos of that old guy at the little internet cafe pulling out his gun and shooting the two robbers. There's the old lady who pulls up her fingers and plugs her ears and covers her ears and turns and bumps into the guy as he's shooting the two robbers. Clearly someone who's never even what if the scenario. Her reaction is there's a gun sh fight going on right now I'm plugging my ears and closing my eyes and turning my back towards it. So you got to train for those kind of situations. I don't. I, I think it'd be interesting if everyone took it serious and did high-level training, but most people don't. Even if you took a couple classes on it, even if you read this book when it came out. Um, but really, having tools available, like a flashlight's not going to help you during the day in a well-lit mall. In a dark parking lot, it's one of the best tools you can have. So even thinking about that, what weapons of opportunity are up here by the cash register? Lots of videos, you see that. The clerk's getting robbed, he grabs something, starts hitting the guy in the head with it. So you got to start looking at all these what ifs. And like I said, if you're at the mall, right then, all of a sudden there's a guy shooting, I'm not going after him with a knife, unless I have to, and I'm pretty good with a knife. I'm not that good compared to the guys I train with, those guys are amazing, but for a normal guy, I'm really good with a blade. I wouldn't go after him. But if I can get out of there safely, would I do that? Then also, too, you've got to start thinking about it. Is it your job to try to rescue everyone, or is it your job to get yourself safe? Because sometimes you do want to help other people. Other times they're more of a liability, and you, you hear about it all the time when people try to rescue people that are drowning, and they get swept away and drowned. So is it noble to die in your family not to have a, a, a father figure anymore? or your parents not to have a son anymore because you tried to save someone who didn't do any training or prepare for any bad situations and froze, and you're fighting with them to try to save them, and that gets you killed. 
I mean, it's a lot of heavy shit. This is why we do two-day, three-day seminars just on this stuff. But, yeah, that's kind of the overall idea on it. The other thing is, are you doing any martial arts? Are you doing any tactical training? Have you taken any classes? Figure out what the laws are where you're at. Figure out the best way to work around them. You see me post on Facebook a lot. I link to a Arizona Revised Statutes, Title 13, which is all the laws on that kind of stuff. Most people don't even know the laws of their, of their, their country, their state, the land where you're at. It sounds like you knew a little bit about it, but like is some states you have a duty to retreat. Whereas if you actually try to fight the guy right there, you're guilty. You're supposed to try to run away, which is insane to me. Some guy got in trouble because he was in the basement. Gunman came in the house. He didn't go out, try to get out the basement window. He turned and shot the guy. He got in trouble. So you got to know what the laws are and you got to figure out the way that you can work within the system. Then obviously too, there's tons of videos of this. I put this in the armory section about don't talk to police. The accident happens, incident happens, you end up having to take someone out, don't talk to them. Because anything you can say will be used against you, will, can and will be used against you in a court of law. So you got to also then legally protect yourself. But that's kind of the mindset of a guy who takes all this stuff seriously, and you got to start that training now, just like we do with pickup, just like we did with anything else. Long answer, but did that help, GP? Yeah, absolutely. I really did. Um, I think I'll start looking at the tactical training. I do plan on getting back into martial arts. I just can't do it right now because I have a lot of stuff going on. But I definitely want to arm myself and prepare myself as much as possible because, you know, it happens literally out of nowhere. Like, it happened twice last year. And half the people that, you know, were almost involved didn't know how to do. So I don't want to be that guy. It's, it's insane. And even just, just fucking a couple of days ago, Arizona had the worst rain in 50 years. Actually, I think in 1911 it was worse. So almost in 100 years we had the most rain ever just a couple of days ago. Fucking freeways were shut down. It was just crazy just from that. We had crazy dust storms. Power goes out. In Ohio, there's the water shortage. There's all this bad shit that happens. So me, being a man, if I can't protect myself and my loved ones, I'm not a man. So being able to protect myself if shit hits the fan and all those different scenarios. Like how many people right now, if shit hit the fan, couldn't live for more than a day or two without leaving the house if all of a sudden the grocery stores are out of food and water? And I'm not saying you have to be some crazy prepper like that horrible TV show, but... Just having stuff in your house, having water, knowing escape routes, having the ways to keep people safe, having protocols in place with your with your girlfriend, which way to walk on the sidewalk. There was the video I just posted on, on my Facebook page the other day. Guy and a girl, get, he gets jumped by a couple guys. She ends up trying to get into the mix. Well, that's not what I would usually do if I'm with a girl. If, I, if I'm fighting and engaging them, I want her to get away because lots of times people get attacked. They both lose. And then the guy's knocked out or beat down and pinned while, they listen, while he listens to the girl getting raped or something in the other room or dies at hearing that. So taking that kind of shit, the world's a cool, fucked up place. Especially with me with all the tactical training and the guys I know, I get fucking secondhand reports and stories from all those guys who are there. It's fucked up. So to me, just not being crazy about it, not, let, not letting it rule your life and you're so paranoid and scared you don't leave the house, but just taking safety measures. I have jumper cables in my car. I have an umbrella in my car. I have a weapon with me. I know how to use it. I've drilled in different scenarios. Might be a big investment, but fuck, man. How much money do fucking people play spending golf and buying golf clubs and fucking fancy balls and a glove and all that? That's People spend tons of money to play golf. Why can't you spend some cool money learning or money learning cool shit like this? So that's right. my thoughts. Anyways, brother, be safe, and I would move. I would get away from there, too. Jersey, New York, all that kind of places <laughs> where it's illegal to defend yourself. And also, like, a lot of the, the officers I meet there, too, just have the different mindset. You're a gun. You're a bad guy. Like, just being treated like that. You're in Arizona. Guys come out here to do one-on-ones with me. Guys from other countries. I'm like, yeah, you're over 21. I could give you one of my guns right now. You can carry it concealed. We can walk through the mall with it right now. Nothing, nothing bad happens. We're a safe place. I got stopped by a cop. I go, hey, just let you know I have a gun uh, on my hip, just to let you know. And he goes, all right, well, don't go for yours, and I won't go for mine. <laughs> guys are pretty cool out here. So That's cool. move Makes to sense. a cooler place. That's my biggest advice. Why do you want to live in Jersey anyways? No, I'm joking. <laughs> anyways, brother, good hearing from you, man. You too. Thanks, man. All right, man. Thanks for your question. So if guys wanted to find out about tactical training, where would they start? Well, there's tons of fucking tactical places out there now. We've been at war for a while. Lots of military guys are coming back. 
there's some bad dudes coming back who are teaching classes now. I'm in Arizona. I'm real partial to Gunsight. I've, I'm friends with some guys that teach there. That's like the original badass, awesome gun school. Anyone who goes there, like Neil went there for when he wrote the um, emergency. I, I told him, I was like, you're going to take a class. That's where you go. Actually, he was in, a, I think, Sheriff Ken Campbell's class. He was a sheriff, an elected sheriff, and he's a Gunsight instructor. So he's one of like, the baddest dudes around with a gun at like, the best school, and he's a sheriff. So that would be like the best county probably to live in ever. Anyways, um, it, it, places like that. The big thing is there's so many people now on YouTube videos and Instagram. It's, th there's a lot of guys now that are online, just like pickup, just like martial arts, that have a big following, but that doesn't necessarily mean those are the guys. That just means people on YouTube like them, but not the legit guys and stuff. So... I, I do some research, do some recon work. Guys are always welcome to come to my forum. There's the armory section. They can post and ask about it. But one of the good things that I recommend is if you're going to go do some gun classes, do read some reviews. Get on some forums, get on some, read some reviews of other students that have been there. See what they have to say. There's tons of great places all over the U.S. Edge weapon training, like firearms training, edge weapon training. Guys need to learn how to use a knife. Kali is amazing. There's lots of different styles of Kali. I mean, fuck, there's like hundreds and hundreds of styles, but there's multiple guys all around that teach it. Lacoste Collie is awesome stuff, Guru Dan. Um, I've been doing Sayat Collie for a while, which is the coolest, coolest stuff with a knife I've ever seen. The, the, the way they teach, the training, it's, it's just as cool as it gets. So if any guys can come across Sayat Collie, I can't endorse it highly enough. It's changed my life, and it just doesn't apply to... to edge weapon, but like everything I do, being the feeder, it's just, it's amazing. Um, other than that, learn some grappling, some ground fighting. Fights go to the ground, grappling, you got to learn it. Um, I did Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, I originally started doing it back in like 98 or 99, and I did it off and on since then. I did some fights back in the day when it was like style versus style, it wasn't MMA or anything, so I don't compare them to what people did now. Like, they were just literally just like grappling matches. Um, but it's different. So I did that back in the day, jiu-jitsu. I loved it, but then I was like, ooh, real life has knives and guns, and that doesn't kind of work too well against that stuff. So I started learning those, and that's how I got into firearms mostly. Um, but yeah, just reading reviews. If anyone wants to message me on, um, my website's bravopua.com. I have a forum. It's free. Like I said, no ads, no advertisement, none of that shit. Um, there's an armory section you guys can log in. I've, I've posted stuff. I've actually did a talk at the 21 convention about self-defense and how to pick your first firearm. It's like an hour-plus-long video. That's in that section. It's free. And I don't even think you have to register to see it, but if you do, you can, you can comment and stuff. It's easier to answer questions. So that's kind of what I recommend. Guns, knives, and learn some, some... Oh, and then do some striking, too. Some boxing or kickboxing. You do that, you're going to be awesome. Gotcha. All right, cool. So uh, give the guys a little uh, taste of what you're going to teach this weekend at the convention. Well, I'm actually going to call an audible when I go there. I've taught online game a few times, and then the last time I caught conversation steering, which was like the biggest missing piece of the puzzle for me. Um, generally what happens is when we go to these talks, lots of them are like just new guys that just recently got into the game, or they read about it a long time ago, but they never took it seriously. So I, when, I, when I do these talks, I always kind of cater it to my audience. Like guys come to my events, I know exactly where they're at because we've been working together for a while and we can go right from a certain way. Going to these events, you're kind of coming in unknown, so I kind of have to assume a lot of these guys are dealing with all the sticking points that we dealt with when we started out, which is, mo more most guys, it's approach anxiety. Um, I figured out a way for me to get over approach anxiety, and it actually turned from approach anxiety to approach excitement. And I talked about that earlier, that when I see a hot girl and I felt those that, that, that adrenaline rush, um, I loved it back then. Like, if I got butterflies in my stomach, I do so much crazy stuff that for me to get that feeling, that's awesome. So I want to embrace it. So when I would see a beautiful girl and I would get that feeling, that twinge, I would go, oh, that's awesome. It's like sonar. And it would ping, and I would I would go in and, and, and approach. So the way that I shifted from approach anxiety to approach excitement and the way that I figured out why having approach anxiety and freezing and not approaching sucked there's something specific that happened. There's a whole drill that I worked out in my head, and it got me past that, and I never had approach anxiety again. Because I developed it, I never thought it was that big of a deal, but basically all the guys I work with, I started explaining it to them the way that I figured it out. And like I had a lot of guys that were, I was doing one-on-ones with, and 
and my boot camps with that I do that are private and you have to apply to go. It's not like other guys' stuff. And um, I have to interview you before you go and stuff. So a lot of these guys that were there and they're like, man, bravo, this is the best thing that I've ever learned ever, like how you got over approach anxiety. This is like, fuck, I wish I would have learned this like two years ago. And it took enough guys telling me that for me to finally go, hmm, maybe I do have something here. So I've been teaching it for years. Um, I've never publicly taught it before. I've never even really discussed it before. But the whole drill of, except for the guys that I work with, um, but the whole drill I did to get through it and all the different scenarios, and once you break it down like this, it, 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 for a lot of guys, it can just click, and instantly they're like, wow, this makes so much sense. I don't have approach anxiety anymore. Or it's so significantly weakened that they're able to push through afterwards. Um, otherwise, a couple guys it doesn't get with. They were never serious anyway, and they're not going to put it into motion anyways, and no big deal. So I usually go to seminars thinking like that, that these are new guys. They have these beginner issues. This is how to get through it. And it's a quick talk, too, and then I want to do some Q&A at the end where guys can ask me anything they want because I've been doing this stuff for a while. I can go three, four days nonstop teaching stuff all the way up to my most advanced, crazy, same-night lay stuff that I don't think anyone's ever taught before, like my Kino Escalate. Fuck Kino Escalation lay report. So anyways, I can do all that stuff, but I was like, I want to have a nice one specific talk instead of just a talk of me talking about how good I am or trying to sell some DVDs for a low, low price that only lasts for 20 minutes. So, approach anxiety. Okay. Sounds good. So, if you would like to be at that uh, conference this weekend, just go to UPUAC slash discount. You can get a 10% off, and hopefully we will see you this weekend. All right, man, I want to thank you for calling in. It's been a great call. Uh, even though we got off of the topic of women and dating, it's still good. It still applies. It's part of being a man. So it's true. Right there. That's true. Maybe I should right. talk about guns while I'm there. I don't know. But no, I'm, I think I'm going to stick with approach anxiety. <laughs> it's all good. All right, man. Well, thanks for all calling right, in. I'll see you Saturday. All right, Thank you. And you can say goodbye. Hold on a second. All right, guys. You're unmuted. Say goodbye, and we will talk to you later. Take care, bro. Cool. Thanks so much, Steve. Yeah, later, bro. Goodness, bravo. Take care, guys. Glad this helped you guys. Thank we didn't you. have this Thank stuff you. when we started out, so I'm glad we can help, brother. Gracias. Yeah. All right, guys. Take care. Talk to you later. Later. Yeah. Later. Bye.